In this, part two of the series on the acid-base imbalance hypothesis, I talked to Vicky van der Tote and Dr. Jeremy Rossman about which interventions would be worth testing in light of the hypothesis. Vicky spoke publicly on Twitter about her experience and how it may have contributed to her complete recovery from long COVID. Are there lessons there for all of us? Let's dive in. So let's say that once you, you get this clinical trial up and running and you do a bunch of tests and you've got some really nice rigorous controls and it comes back and you go, hey, presto, what we thought was happening looks like it really is happening. What what do we do about it? What are those sort of treatment modalities or what are the things that we can try? Uh, what are the pathways? Like, where do we go? <laughs> well, um, there's quite a lot of different things to test. And I shared a little bit on Twitter, uh, which is true. Based on this, uh, I, I tried to treat myself. You know, I was I was desperate uh, all, more than two years into my long COVID struggles. And so thinking, okay, logically, what can I do to um, to possibly fix this, knowing that my, my lactate levels were raised? I mentioned different components that I tried myself. Of course, this is not tested. We want to test it. But an acid-based disruption is something that is well studied. And so there already are some uh, interventions available uh, that we can test in long COVID. And so, yeah, I think this really leaves us with so many different things to, to try out, uh, which are either focused on, on just doing um, balancing out acid base or specifically targeted on a lactate. Let's talk through some of those because people want to know, right? This is, you know, how, how difficult or easy is it to sort of start trying to manage this at home or do you need to go and see your doctor and blah, blah, blah. Well, I mean, one thing one thing to just sort of mention sort of broadly here is that, you know, treating acidosis, you know, is something that is done clinically. Um, but also what we're sort of looking at is is not quite th that level of like acute acidosis that's treated sort of in one way in the clinic, but more what we're talking about is sort of like a chronic acidosis. And chronic acidosis is often seen in, you know, chronic kidney disease. And so in, in things like that, we have a lot of papers and a lot of research that people have used different techniques to try and treat that. Um, and so, you know, we're basing a lot of what we look at you know, on published research that has been used in other chronic acidosis conditions. So I, I just want to sort of say that to begin with, this is not, you know, I'm just sort of picking things that, that may work or not, but stuff that has been studied, but importantly, in chronic acidosis. Uh, so what are those things? that have been studied in chronic acidosis? There is usually a treatment with bicarbonate. So you could think of um, getting an IV drip, for example, uh, which could potentially you know, bring more bases to the body and thereby balance out the acidity. Um, there are some different types of medications um, under different labels. It's so difficult to boil it down because we don't know specifically in long COVID which of these things will help. Because I feel like it's important to mention here that because you have this compensatory mechanism going on, whenever you try to add too many bases to the body in one time, you may actually get this compensatory mechanism. So instead of having uh, acidosis, you may actually switch to alkalosis. And so, of course, that brings on a whole new set of issues. And so this is not as easy as just, you know, getting an IV and getting a whole lot of base into the body because, yeah, you may actually shift the whole time between acidosis and alkalosis without actually being able to treat the problem. And so, you know, just in terms of what I have done, knowing that, is I try to slowly lower the amount of acid in my body. And so, uh, you know, you asked, I'm just going to give it a couple of details and, and on what I tried. Um, and so my thought was, well, you can get rid of all this excess acid potentially through the urine. So I dramatically increased my water intake and added electrolytes to every single glass of water that I drank. And so thereby increasing the amount of bases um, and, you know, 
making sure that I have to go to the bathroom a whole lot of times. And every time it was almost like this victory, you know, every time you go to the bathroom, yes, got rid of a little bit of excess acid, um, got a little bit weird there. Um, and then, um, you know, diet, um, in terms of diet, dramatically increased the amount of vegetables that I had, as well as, you know, looking at ways of eliminating the amount of acid producing foods. So this is also something that has been tried in chronic kidney disease. There's a couple of papers on this, um, on a low prowl diet. And so that's prowl is the potential renal, renal acid load of a diet. And so, yeah, for every type of food, there's this calculated number um, of the, the acid load that it holds. And so based on that, you can either have something that is high acid producing, such as meat and dairy and grains uh, and high protein foods, or something that is more base producing. Uh, and so low prowl, such as most vegetables, uh, some nuts, most fruits, um, and so by balancing that out, I thought, well, if it's been tried in chronic kidney disease, it could potentially help me. Uh, and so I tried out this, this diet as well, and it really served me well. Um, as well as, you know, this breathing, because breathing is a compensatory mechanism. I was like, well, if I can shift from automatic breathing to conscious breathing, um, I could potentially keep that in check. And so I really try to remind myself nonstop um, to do this conscious breathing. So instead of switching to like a, maybe like a type of hyperventilation, constantly reminding myself like, okay, deep breathing, making sure that everything stays steady. And then there's movement. Potentially, you know, there, there could be acid getting kind of like stuck in certain places because you can have localized acidosis. And so by both doing lymph drainage um, as well as, you know, doing these gentle stretches, uh, not just once, but really all throughout the day, could potentially get it out of certain tissues. And so by kind of combining all these different things, I quickly started improving and so I feel like, yeah, I have to say this is for me. Doesn't mean that it's going to work for everyone. I know it sounds really simple, even though it wasn't. But yeah, this is a way of slowly um, bringing down that acid level. And I think slowly is really the key word here and, and what may be the, the answer to this, the, the way to kind of like break that feedback loop. So how long ago did you start doing this? And... How, um, how have your have the improvements been sustained and what are you able to like how much improvement has there been are you able to do things now that you couldn't do before you know are you able to exercise where are you at okay so this all of this started last year march so at the beginning of march this uh, i stumbled upon this mechanism and i started with this treatment i think the first week of march um and it was really within week one and a half week that I was already dramatically improved um to a point that I was able to go on walks again uh, I could go up and down the stairs um um and and just for comparison I hadn't been able to even uh, walk to the end of the street I hadn't been able to you know take a shower and then stay upright uh, and so it was a dramatic shift within a short amount of time and yes um it had I stayed that way. I have to note that I did get reinfected in the meantime. I uh, got reinfected in October last year. And so, unfortunately, even though you can recover, uh, doesn't mean that it stays that way and that you're immune all of a sudden. And so it really like put me back and immediately all these long COVID symptoms started to come back. But also now knowing what I had to do to to get better, I immediately, you know, up the all the things, all the those different aspects that I just mentioned, uh, those different components to the treatment, and I was able to recover again. And so, yes, um, I'm doing great. I can actually do everything again. I work full time. Um, I work out. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's been fantastic after being sick for so long. I'm really happy to hear that. 
And Craig, well, oh, congratulations. Is that the right word? I don't know, but I'm Thank really you. happy. For you. <laughs> yeah, I'm really I'm happy, happy to see it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so one one question just pops to mind. If anybody watching this thinks, okay, can I go to my? Is it if I go to my doctor? Is there anything I can ask for that would be useful in terms of indic indicating whether this might be a problem? Bearing in mind that a normal set of bloods might just come back normal. Is there any like what could, can they do that might shine some lights on whether they might be, you know, suffering like this? You know, you do have that issue that, you know, first of all, this hasn't been proven. So, you know, we can't say for sure that, you know, this is going to hold up all the way down the line, but also that, you know, with that variability, you don't, you know, really know. But, you know, we have heard of patients going in to get that blood test and you could get, you know, lactate tested, you could get, you know, pH tested. Um, and sometimes that does show an effect. You know, sometimes if you're doing home testing, you can actually bring that to your doctor. You can actually talk about what's going on and what you're seeing. And if you're actually consistently seeing numbers that are very concerning, then, you know, that may be an actionable point. But of course, you know, this is a hypothesis. So, you know, if we were able to show, yes, this happens or this happens in, you know, maybe just this cohort of patients or maybe just happens in these circumstances, or maybe is universal, then, you know, you, you would have a much better basis to go into your doctor and to, you know, say, okay, I would like this test. Um, you know, so there, there is a little bit more, but it's, it's also a little bit vague right now. And in terms of treatment, you know, the, the same thing is true. You know, first of all, you know, if somebody is going in for chronic kidney disease and looking for acidosis, there's not a standard of care. You know, there's not like a pill, you know, people tend to want, you know, a pill, a prescription, something that they can just take, they can take it for a week, like an antibiotic or something like that, and be done. And, you know, with acidosis, it doesn't tend to be like that, you know, maybe if you were able to cure the underlying issue, but with this, it's a little bit more, we're trying to figure out, we're trying to make longer term changes. Um, and we also don't know, is the virus still there? Is persistent virus or persistent viral protein still there? And always sort of waiting to potentially cause problems or not? You know, that's, that's a huge unanswered question. So it, it's a little bit difficult to say what you could ask for or do in the clinic there's some, but we're, we're really trying to get that clinical trial data so that we can arm patients with more information and more direct action. So one final question for both of you. If Elon Musk came along and said, right, each of you can have a million dollars to research whatever, or $10 million to research whatever you want in the field of long COVID, what would you want to do? I'm happy that you changed it from one to 10 because clinical trials are really expensive. And yeah. for one, we could get our clinical trial done. Uh, but for 10, we can do a lot more. First, do this whole clinical trial, of course. But what I would be most curious about is I would like to test the treatment as I did it, just on its own. Um, but I would like to see if uh, a combination of the, the treatments that are already being tried with um, treating the acid base imbalance um, could actually provide full recovery for some that may not respond well to the treatment that helped me so much. Uh, I think that could be really a key here. And then as a secondary, because we have 10 million, right? I would like to see specifically more elaborately what the effects of acid base imbalance on the brain are and on potentially mental health effects as well. Mm. Yeah, agreed. I mean, what's really interesting about this whole theory is how it does explain a bunch of the stuff that we've been seeing that's weird, whether it's this, you know, hyperventilation, you know, like, why are our, why is our breathing so shallow and odd until you start getting control of it? Why mm -hmm. is breath work so effective? Well, actually, it might yeah. just be compensating for some of this stuff. You know, why are we seeing yeah. the rates of, you know, not just cognitive dysfunction and memory and visual and spatial processing, um, but also anxiety and depression and all of this too, right? Could, you know, acid yeah. base somewhere in the CNS or the brain be causing that? So huge, huge subjects. Um, Jeremy, uh, $10 yeah. million, what do you spend yes. it on? So, I mean, first of all, I would say, basically, if we had $10 million to, to go research this, we would do what we're doing, we would just do it 
larger. But of course, mm -hmm. you know, with a lot of this clinical trial, you don't just jump into that final thing. You got to sort of slowly iteratively go. So we need to get that data to show that this is going on. And then we want to go and test in different interventions. I really think that combination of different interventions is something that, that could be really important, you know, looking at clotting, looking at inflammation, looking at acidosis, but maybe also even adding things in like Paxlovid that is being tested right now, yeah. you know, if there is an effect of persistent virus. So that combination is really important, but also expand that to as wide a range as patients as we can. Look for a large number of patients, look for different subsets of long COVID, look at what's going on in ME, look at other sort of chronic conditions. And then maybe if we have a little money left over, also look at some of the molecular mechanisms going on here, trying to really yes. dive in to understand all the details of how this is being caused, because that also offers more intervention points. Agreed. Fascinating subject. Thank you both so much for your work. And I think it's really exciting. And I look forward to hearing more about your research. Hope you found that enlightening and helpful. I will be checking back in with Vicky and Jeremy once there's more to report on their trials. Next up, I'll be talking to Dr. Jordan Vaughan about his experiences in diagnosing and treating abnormal clotting in long COVID. Look after yourselves. Until next time.